Um, thank you all for coming out, being a part. Thank you for agreeing to take time out of your day to, you, to even like, you know, work through this with us and, and just be in community with one another about a very, you know, critical, I think, theoretical um, construction that has come through political theory by way of Dr. James in um, this past year. Um, I want to pass it to Anna so that we can get started with a centering moment and then Dr. James and then from there we will start with, um, we'll go down the list of each individual person. Um, really briefly before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that we want to keep your engagement with Dr. James um, no more than seven to ten minutes apiece so that we can actually get to each person. Um, in addition to that, I also want to open it up to know that anybody can engage anybody's questions. This is a roundtable. Don't be afraid to respond to other people and their projects and, and what they're, they offered, in addition to the comments that Dr. James will offer to each person. So that's it. I'm off the scene. Thank you all for being here. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ra. Um, so to get us started, um, I want to bring us into the text, into Fulcrum, um, Captive Maternal Leverages Democracy as a way to ground our conversation um, and to, to locate a place for us to dig into the conundrum that we're all going to be carefully and lo lovingly in dialogue around today. So in there she writes, the Captive Maternal Conundrum 101, how to embrace structures that historically preyed and continue to prey upon your black embodiment and that of your kin and children through the violent disruption of natality and accumulation and extraction driven theft and exploitation of our black generative powers, emotional, intellectual, physical, material. This is the conundrum of the captive maternal, the non-gender or agender functionaries who reproduce the world through the microcosm of family, community, nation. There are four stages of the captive maternal, caretaker, protester, movement maker, marinage engineer, war resistor. She continues, the significant compromise to increase the odds for longevity is a political act in the face of violence. It is not an identity fixture unless one chooses a makeover. So with that, I shouldn't be surprised, but in my naivete, I could never have anticipated that we'd be convening after our elders were murdered in cold blood at a grocery store and after 19 children would be mowed down by an assault rifle. Dr. James, you remind us that if we were to go to the child and ask them how much harm they are willing to tolerate, they'd emphatically say none, no harm, none at all. And yet we're all constantly having to negotiate how much harm, how much violence are we willing to tolerate in our attempts to endure and to persist. This calculus is always daunting, but feels especially tender this week, especially for my work with Black teachers who are working to help children, youth and families make sense of all of this right now. And so it's with those teachers on my mind that I come to you all in earnest. And I want to invite everybody now to take a moment to name who or what or where is on your mind as you engage in this conversation today and put that person, place, idea, commitment in the chat. And then we'll go around and have everyone just share your name and where you're calling from so that we can like be grounded in the placeness of this conversation, despite the fact that we're in a multiverse of Zoom, um, and so that we can say everybody's name uh, with integrity and improperly. So put that in the chat, and then feel free to come off mute and say your name and where you're coming from. And then Dr. James will pass it over to you.
Excellent. So I can start us off, y'all. Um, my name is Anna Elmore. I'm calling from Ypsilanti, Michigan. Um, really grateful to be here. And anyone can come off mute and keep that going. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis Tardy, and I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and I'm also super grateful to be here. I'm sorry, my pronouns are she, her, hers as well. Hi, my name is T. Troutman. I'm calling in from Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, my pronouns are they, them, prefer, but I don't really get upset about the she, her. Come on, y'all. Don't be scared. <laughs> Hi, Hi, everyone. Oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's okay. Who's that? It was me. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ziana. Um, I'm in Binghamton, New York at the moment, but I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. I'm really grateful to be here. Thank oh my you. God, Cape Town. Let's connect after it. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Um, my name is Bill Fina. Uh, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm based in Baltimore, um, born in Liberia. Hey, y'all. I'm John John. I'm from Detroit. I'm calling from Mexico City. Hey, how y'all doing? I'm Chris. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. It don't really matter to me, y'all. Uh, I'm from Third Ward. Um, and yeah, it's nice, to, it's nice to meet everybody. Hi everyone, my name is Bria. I use she, they pronouns. I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York, but I grew up in Peachy County, Capitol Heights specifically, and my family is from North Carolina. So not sure if I have any Charlotte folks on the call, but hey. <laughs> Um, I think it's only Jaden and I that's <laughs> typical of us. Um, that's my best friend, y'all. Um, I'm Jordan, calling from Chicago, but I'm originally from Miami, Florida. Um, any pronouns are cool. Um, and I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you guys for organizing it. And, um, it's so great to see familiar faces and new. Yeah, I'm Jaden. I'm uh, calling from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm originally from Texas City, Texas. Uh, Chris, you probably know where that is since you're from Third Ward. Um, yeah, I'm also very excited to be here. Uh, so many brilliant people here today. So, Hi, I'm Joy. I'm in New York City. I was about to say the city, but you know, that sounds like inflated. Um, it's really great to see your beautiful faces. And um, it's comforting. So thank you all. And I look forward to learning from you and with you. Um, I think that's a, oh, well, I'm Ra, um, pronoun Beishi. Um, I'm from the Bronx, New York. I'm currently on a plantation, so welcome. Um, I think this is a great time to pass this to Dr. James to open and say um, whatever you wanna to say to get us started. And then from there, we will start going around um, to each individual person. So I'll just start it off this way. Dr. James has read you all's bios, so you don't have to make your introductions and what you do very long, um, but you can just give a brief, brief summary for everyone else in the group who has not read your bio, but please keep it very brief, what you do and what your project is speaking to, and then your question. Um, so we'll go to Dr. James to open and then we'll go straight to T for the first question. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, Ra, Ra gave me instructions. <laughs> so I'm gonna fail right now. I just think that everything we know to be true is true and unfolding but it's really wonderful to see your courage 
and facing what is true and seeing the beauty that undergirds and also just the will to resist and transcend. So whatever you do with the captive maternal is whatever you decide to do. It has nothing to do about me, right? It's just a recognition that you exist and that your contributions are not fully known, but always are being revealed despite the violence arrayed against us. So thank you. You can go T. Oh, okay, well, it's on me. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to meet folks who I don't know, and it's great to see everybody that I haven't seen in a while that I do know. Um, so I am a Black geographer. I'm a geography PhD student, and my uh, project is a critique of Atlanta, specifically Atlanta and the concept of the city as the Black Mecca and a specific type of anti-Black urbanism that produces its urban form. And so a central part of this project is critiquing the, the role of the Black communal and the building of the Black Mecca as an institution. Um, and I think the captive maternal for me is really instructive um, where Dr. James gets into the, the generative capacity of the Black communal, communal love. Um, and so my question is, uh, Dr. James, in your early work critiquing both the talented 10th and the beloved community, I'm interested in the way that that earlier work informed your formulation of the captive maternal and how this later work on the captive maternal maybe um, highlighted or illuminated some things um, relative to Black struggle, Black love, the beloved community, and the talented 10th. Um, so I hope that's clear. Right. I'm sorry if I'm not clear about the process. So I should respond individually, right? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, when you were sharing and asking, it reminded me of Charlene Mitchell, who is in her 90s now and who lives in Harlem. She's an African-American communist leader. She's the one that recruited Angela Davis into the Communist Party USA through the Che Lumumba Club in California um, because I used to, decades ago, roll with different kinds of radicals, I was able to meet her. And she's the one who told me to go to the Schomburg Library and to read every memoir that Du Bois ever wrote. And I think in part is because she understood, I mean, I can't speak for her, right? But I think in part, she understood the betrayal that would be built in to the attempt to care for black communities and lead them. And so Ra has like, you know, has pushed me to think more about betrayals, right? Which are not always like the happiest thought you wanna have in the morning, but it's the afternoon. So I guess this is gonna work. So the betrayal would be that the black elite after being processed through the academy would not be able to embrace the political will or desire of people who were desperately in need of freedom. And so I feel like indirectly without her critiquing black elites because she was like embedded with them, right? And also closely tied to an icon she had mentored for decades. I felt that she like directed me like to do an errand and so I went into Schomburg, I read everything. I saw how Du Bois had betrayed Ida B. Wells, who I considered to be an ancestor, only later to complain that, you know, there were no radicals when the NAACP was ready to kick him out after they had kicked Ida B. Wells out like years earlier. And I don't think there's a resolution um, in any of my writings. I think that in some ways, it sounds really weird, but why not? It's a delivery system. Like people ask me to do things that are supposed to be helpful. And yeah, I'll be bitching about it. <laughs> I won't do anything. But it's like, okay, I'll do it, right? And then I deliver what I'm supposed to do. 
but I don't think they portray, I don't think people prepare you for when you do engage in the deliverables and they're not compatible, right, with the dominant narrative. In fact, they want you to deliver something that is going to destabilize the dominant narrative, but they don't warn you about what will follow that destabilization. So you can't, I can't keep saying I'm just an errand person, you know, because it's like decades ago when I'm like, you know, I'm an elder. Sarah, I want you to show me more respect. <laughs> Thank you. And so I just pull that card out when I can. So there's like humility, but I, I think also there's anger. I don't think it's just about Buffalo or Uvalde. I mean, this bullshit culture was always lethal and genocidal. But it's like the Aaron boy, Aaron girl, Aaron X, right? To, to run deliveries as if you're putting out groceries. And nobody's like, well, why don't we just get some land and grow our own food? Why don't we just create maronage and build our own zones? So in some ways, a lot of my work is about critiques but I'm not sure that's sufficient anymore. Thank you for that. Um, hello everyone, it's so nice to meet you all. Um, I don't think I know anyone on this call, so hello. <laughs> I was good to see new faces. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Alexis and um, I'm an organizer right now, um, but I'm also a doctoral of ministry student um, in seminary. And my thesis uh, when I was doing my master's um, was around recovering black women's experiences, particularly in the Pentecostal church, which is where I grew up, um, black Pentecostalism. So I wanted to do that through Azusa Street um, and black Pentecostalism. Um, and I also wanted to understand why Black women were still in the Black church, especially with the ways that we um, have to confront um, sexism and the like. And I also wanted to talk about church hurt um, as spiritual trauma um, and the ways that we are um, responsible or, or called to healing, but also dismantling um, the forces that, that cause that spiritual trauma in the first place. Um, and so when I encountered the captive maternal, um, I was thinking about it through the lens of Moses's mother, um, Yochaved, and um, I also began to think of it as Moses as the captive maternal, um, but also the Hebrew uh, midwives that made his, um, his birthing process and growing up process possible, um, as well as Pharaoh's daughter. So the ways that um, the captive maternal also crossed um, across class um, when it came to Moses's birth um, as well. So um, Dr. James, I had a question based on um, what you wrote. I believe it was in the preface, but you said spirituality offers a haven that moves beyond the cave and rational choice models, but fails to quell the mayhem of conquistadors. So my question is, can spirituality be more than a haven, um, but a force to quell, dismantle, overthrow um, the demonic and genocidal forces of the state? Um, especially as we talk or as you speak about um, the discipline of agape as political will. Thanks, Alexis. Um, yeah, two Black on Black Miss podcasts, right, told me about your work and I listened to your sermon. And I was struck about the origin story and how you didn't back away from violence that violence was part of the origin story. I mean, how do you get Moses in a basket of reeds? Because some Pharaoh has a genocidal project, right? The, we, you know, we're, what's it, misopedia, if that's how you pronounce it, the hatred of children. So how do you defeat your opposition? You go for the child. And in some ways, you know, I don't do as much therapeutic stuff probably as I should, but I do acknowledge that inside of us is that permanent child. And that is the brilliance and the incessant demands for what cannot be delivered. So I talked earlier about Charlene Mitchell, like giving me a task. I mean, I could have said no, but it was like, it's your job, do it. And so that was a deliverable. 
but there's something beyond the deliverables, right? And whether we can see them, whether we can recognize them, even if we can see them, I'm not sure. Maybe they're a haze, maybe it's a fuzzy outline, maybe it looks like a ghost or a whisper. But there's something that is beyond the deliverable, the tangible, the like, oh, I, you know, whether it's I voted, I did the book, I showed up at the protest, whatever, there's something beyond it. And I'm not even sure how to define spirituality, but maybe I'm thinking now, Alexis, maybe it's the skeleton. Maybe it's the only thing that really holds you up even when you're reduced to bones or you feel like you're reduced to bones and everything aches, right? So what I think now is that I'm not going to be an errant person anymore, but I'm not sure that I'm going to be spiritually evolved either. And I agree to those terms. Ooh, can and you clarify that distinction between an Aaron person and being and not being spiritually involved? Like what's that distinction about? Well, I think in part like agape as political will. And I've said before, I think maybe when we we're having our conversation, Ra, that you have to love people you don't even like. And so that's a discipline. I know Mars wrote, you know, the critique of Kaaba about like hope should not be a discipline. And I was on a forum like for two hours last night with about 30 or 40 groups in the South in the Bahamas, black organizers. And it was interesting what they took from it. I mean, they want the hope, right? And I wasn't saying there is no such thing as hope or I'm not into hope. I was just like, well, do you have a security apparatus? And then it became, well, that's anti-hope. And then that's when I get really like, okay, this doesn't make sense. So is this my rational mind that's like being dominant or something? And I don't think so. I think that the fear drives us into a form of spirituality that becomes a zone of comfort because it's not quite tangible and it's promissory. And I've agreed not to have the promises it would be nice but you know i'm at this stage in my life like you know but i'm only saying if you don't think about security then you're not thinking about violence and spirituality is not sufficient in terms of quelling violence but that's where they were going and so if i remember and alexis you you uh, you Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think Moses got to cross over into the promised land. Is that true? Did I misread? No, that's true. He did. Okay. That makes sense to me. Like not everybody's gonna cross over, which means that spirituality is available to gaze upon, to briefly be embraced by, but it's not the spirit that's gonna cross over with you. It's not gonna put you on its wings and take you to the next stage, right? And there's some people who want to go to the next stage so much that I feel maybe they make a bargain with spirit. I mean, it's not the same thing as a bargain with the devil, right? Because we have these dichotomies. I mean, it's always the bargains for good and for community. But I think, you know, we talk, I talked about the stages of the captive maternal raw helped me figure it out. Like, what do you do after the zone of betrayal? After the zone of marinage, what do you do with the war resistor? Maybe you remain haunted. I mean, the hunt is ever present. You know, you walk into a grocery store or elementary store, whatever. And it's like, you know, the proto-fascists are here and they're not going anywhere. So what's the vehicle, what, what transports us? I'm starting to think acceptance, that I can work my way through the stages and I can work my way back down. But I, nobody promised to put me on their wings and take me to a haven. And before I was like totally pissed about this, what do you mean? I've been in line for like decades, like here's my card. 
but it's like, no, that's not how it works. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's not how it works. I don't have a problem with it anymore. I'm still pissed, but I don't have a problem with it. And in some ways that becomes, and not liberation, I'm not even sure the word freeing, it's definitely not freedom. But I think there's a way in which when acceptance sits in, it's easier to love because I'm no longer disappointed. Or I mean, I get destabilized, you know, by the, the violence and the stuff, but it's not unexpected. And so I can stay stable in the midst of chaos with the understanding there's no train that's gonna pick me up and take me elsewhere. So I, I mentioned last night when I was trying to like at least make a cultural, you know, biblical connection, I mentioned Aretha Franklin when she did the taping in the church, right? In Los Angeles in the early seventies. And you can see Mick Jagger dancing the aisle, which is kind of weird. And I don't know why I brought it up. It was a bit surreal. So, but focusing on, you know, the queen of soul, I mean, Mary, don't you weep, Martha, don't you moan because Pharaoh's armies drowned in the sea one day. You're not, I don't think in the people I know in these communities of spirituality, I'm not supposed to say the second stanza about Pharaoh's armies, right? And so that's why I don't get to cross over. But that's, you know, I agree to the terms. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. James. Jordan, it looks like you have a question. No, yeah, I just more so wanted to <laughs> embolden <laughs> Professor James's point. And of course, Rebecca and Alexis, you guys are, you know, the seminarians or the actual <laughs> religious historians here, so correct me if I'm wrong. But <clears throat> even more to your point, Professor James, Moses doesn't get to go into the promised land because he disobeys God by striking a rock that he's supposed to speak to to feed or nourish um, a hungry and starving and thirsty um, Israelite population, right? So the Israelites are upset and because they're hungry and there's no food and there's no water and because they've been walking around, uh, I can't think of the name of the desert that they've been walking around for a long time, for years, maybe like 39 years it's supposed to be at this point. And Moses, is told by God to speak into a rock and the rock is gonna bring forth water. And instead of speaking into the rock, he hits the rock. So there, there is even more so to your point and the biblical metaphor that you're using, like there's even more corroboration to this idea around the, the, serious, um, the serious inefficacy of spirit as in terms of like violence as a solution. There's a serious, violence seems illegible to spirit even um, as an option for uh, producing something that actually produces or gives us our means, you know? Um, so yeah, just, I really appreciated that. No, I appreciate you bringing that in too, because it also, is it Sephora, Moses' wife, who's also black? And so the Israelites are having problems here. It's like, oh, you married a black woman? You know, it's, there's, right, there are all these layers. And I'm wondering if this is a little like, I don't know, sacrilegious, who knows? I wonder if there's this moment when we're just exhausted by the God or the gods. It's like they're high maintenance, right? And it's just like, again, it's, it's like when Charlene sends me out on a mission or the deity send me out on a mission. I mean, this is why I was struck by Oshun, right? Taking the risk, losing her beauty, finding another radiance after having her feathers burnt off her, scorched off, right? But I think a lot of this is our willingness to become the God or the demigod we seek, our willingness to become spirit 
And you're right, I think if this is what you're saying, there's a huge issue around discipline and following instructions. And I do like discipline because I'm not a fan of chaos. But discipline, I mean, didn't really work for us. I mean, it was always used against us, right? And I'm not striking it out or saying don't do it, but I wonder if there's a way to play with it and to understand that on a good day, the captive maternal can be disciplined by agape. On a bad day, you should just cross the street, right? Because spirit manifests, but also I've seen people call for spirit and they can't find it, it doesn't show up, or at least not in time. And so if time is always determined by spirit, then what do we get to determine? So that's why I say, I agree to the terms. Like I'm, you know, I can't, I can just follow so many rules just so long, right? With so many promises. And I'm not saying that, and there are captive maternals who go rogue. I mean, I would say some of the political prisoners I've tried to support over the decades, Sundiata just got out. Some people are offshore, you know, on an island. They, they became the embodiment of will, love, and spirit, but also there is a misalignment because even as Asada says in her memoir, they never asked the community if they wanted a liberation army. And I'm betting if you pulled the community, they would have said no, right? Because they're disciplined. And I, again, I keep saying I'm not a revolutionary. Roz makes fun of me and says, I'm a gardener, I'm a cook, I'm a librarian. Like I change, you know, job descriptions every time. But one thing I do know is that I agree to the terms of sacrifice, but I have not agreed to the terms of annihilation. And so maybe I'm not worthy of spirit. Um, I believe. Uh, yes, we got to move to Delfina. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so I've been looking at um, originally when I first um, started to understand captive maternal in my work, it was through Keith Davis Jr. Um, and the fight that we've been fighting for six years um, to see his freedom, right? Um, I'll drop the link to the website in the chat um, and understanding Baltimore and all of his politics in that way. Um, but recently this year, um, started off as a personal project. I've been doing more dig diving into Liberia's history. So I was born in Liberia um, and um, experienced our, our, our second um, civil war. Uh, my family then fled to Ivory Coast before then fleeing to the US in 2001. And what is um, something about Liberia's history is that, and you hear from a lot of Liberians is that literally the people themselves do not know the history. Um, because we didn't write it, right? Um, and then you have a war that takes away your access to archives, to everything else. Um, and so people literally have never engaged with like the in and outs of our history who are who are living in Liberia. Um, but in um, the uh, 2000s, um, which is our last civil war, uh, the women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace um, was formulated between Christ Christian and Muslim women who had gotten to the point where they realized like this civil war was not going to end. Um, not only that, but that America was not gonna intervene, right? And for a long time, the US within Liberia context has been seen as the parent of Liberia, um, who is essentially like our far away protector, um, who we, we take every political side with. Liberia has always sided um, with the US um, and Israel as well, actually. And so um, at the height of the war, um, these women came together and decided like, we need to do something. Like we, we gonna have to stop this war um, because all of the, from Ghana to Nigeria, all of these political figures that were coming together days after days after months were not reaching some kind of a ceasefire. Um, and so they organized together and the last big action that they did was um, they begin to undress. And in my culture, like to see an elderly woman undress is considered a curse. Um, and so it, it is the only thing that men tend to respond to, right? Um, and so they began to undress and told these men, like we are literally not leaving this building until you come to an agreement. 
But these women also supported Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Um, she's considered the first um, woman president on the continent. Um, she was Harvard educated, grew up in the US and so forth. And these women, they organized and they put all of their backing towards Ellen because they felt that the material change that we needed, she would be able to be the one to do so. And so Ellen is regarded as Liberia's first and ever democratically elected president of the country. Um, she brought in the Clinton, she brought in Oprah and so forth. But as I was reading the captive maternal, what I started to think about is literally how um, these women, because Lemma, who was one of them, later came out and she said, my biggest regret um, is allowing for Ellen Johnson to become president. I didn't realize that I was literally ushering in US imperialism into the country. And so you think about this captive maternal of these women who they saw that like, we're dying, like we're, we're jumping over bodies every day. We had no food, right? Liberia, we had no food. We have no access to power. There is nothing. We need like an instant material change. This is our hope. I um, mean, so I guess it's not more of a question, but to gauge in conversation of like what it means to grapple with um, as, as dark as it sounds that at the, at the time, the war that we was experiencing was in some sense an undoing of US imperialism, like the engaging of violence that needed to be had, like that murdering and killing that was happening was the only way that the people would be able to detach themselves under the US. And at the same time, you have these women who are saying like, there is literally no, no peace in this country. Um, we, we we're gonna have to die and they have to grapple with that. So how does the captive maternal I don't even have the formulator of the question, like how do we begin to grapple with death and violence um, when it's like our need is to almost save our people? Because it was either we're gonna usher in this woman as president or we're going to sustain another 15, mind you at this point we had been 14 years into a, a civil war. We're gonna go another 20 years. Like our population has dwindled. We have nothing, right? Like how, how do we sit in, in, in the midst of like that despair? Um, of do something and give this labor um, or do nothing. And, and we could possibly see like the annihilation of this entire population. I'm hoping this question makes sense. I can clarify more if it doesn't, um, but that is kind of like where I was sitting with the captive maternal. Yeah, thanks. Um, doing nothing is not an option, but of course people choose that you know, out of fear, paralysis, depression, fatigue. I think for us in the US, because it's an empire, we would have to engineer strategies to the best of our ability to cripple the war machinery. I mean, Barack Obama probably functioned in a similar capacity that Ellen Johnson did, right? And Vice President Harris, I mean, she's, I mean, she doesn't really do anything. I mean, she does something, she has a job, right? But there's no real power. And there's not even the power of the presentation of a black face to justify the incursions and the violence of these neo-colonial or post-colonial, whatever they are, imperial endeavors. So when I think of US militarism, and I've said before, I, I came, I grew up in a military family. I mean, there's something, it's a machine. And even the, the humans that are within it as an employment sector become, you know, mechanical. It's efficient. And life doesn't mean anything. So I've, I don't have an answer, but I've, I have a desire, like what would be the Achilles heel to cut on this empire to make it stumble in terms of its exporting violence, including the mercenaries like Eric Prince. He's a Navy SEAL, now he's a multi-billionaire, right? Because he has, the, it's the private armies, it's not even the state armies anymore, it's the mercenaries in the private army. So the war resistor, what is the role of the war resistor? And again, I go back to the folks I was talking to and I really respect them, but I don't think they can grapple with the concept of war. And so the US had a long corridor 
at least, you know, the black middle class, the petty bourgeoisie of self-deception because our wars look like, you know, Buffalo. And then you can say that's a criminal individual one-off and it's tragic or like lynchings, et cetera, et cetera. But we haven't lived the conditions. I mean, we, we, they tax us, so we pay for those conditions to be exported to other countries. But we haven't lived under the blowback, which we've agreed to. And I know, you know, I've looked at the war resistors leagues, like the veterans in opposition to war. I've constantly, you know, off and on tried to figure out how we could talk about anti-Black violence and everything, you know, Afro, you know, everything that's like abolitionism, all the important buzzwords right now, and just sort of drill down and say war. I think that was part of airbrushing revolution for the sake of abolition. It's like war is not a metaphor. So just, you know, it's time to grow up and not you obviously, but I'm talking about Americans who shop way too much and who distract themselves with gadgets, which includes me on some days. So what kind of courage does that look like? And what does it mean like yesterday to try to say this is, we're talking about war. I know we're talking about like, there's not enough housing and there's not enough food, but I am trying to think how could we focus? Like we don't focus, like we're like our, our attention is all over the place. And we can talk about Pan-African or international Black, you know, like the solidarity around the globe, but it, it would have to, this is going to sound weird, it ha we'd have to look a little bit like Moses. Like we, you know, I call it the wild card, like throw something down. It doesn't have to be material helps, but it could be theoretical, ideological, put a concept down that it's going to be difficult to co-op and keep bringing people back to the war. Like, of course you don't wanna be in a war, but stop pretending like you're not already in one. Like, I understand, I don't wanna be in one either, but I'm not pretending like this isn't just because, you know, I eat and I pay my taxes and I don't have to think about AFRICOM or drone strikes. I already know I'm paying for that. So is that a zone? I don't think it's a zone of defeat. I think it's a zone of acceptance. And I'm not sure the people that I've been speaking with, I don't think they want to accept right now. And I don't think I have a compelling language, you know, to encourage that. Or, you know, I'm not leading any, I'm not a shepherd. I'm not, but this is my frustration. I mean, I'll, two things like that haunt me or follow me. So one, I love nature and land. And so I grew up on nature and land because the military bases have thousands of acres. But then it dawned on me just years ago that where I was learning to play kickball was the same um, zone, Fort Benning, Georgia, where they were training assassins and death squads. And so when I was giving this talk at Princeton, they were kind of like, oh, talk about home. And I was like, well, you know, maybe sometimes home should be what you burn down. But it's hard to like articulate that and not think everybody's gonna leave the room. Um, thank you. Really briefly, because I, I think what was at the heart of Bill Fina's question that, I mean, Dr. James so brilliantly pointed us to regarding war is the other side of like, is there any way, way to fight a war without the survival mechanisms used to survive the war being aiding our own death, right? Which is why I love what you did with the Liberia example, because it's like, they're bringing it's kind of like a peace treaty, right? Like calling it truce, like we're, they're bringing it in as a way to say that like, you know, we're trying to shift the country in a different direction, but at the same time, like we don't even understand sometimes that the war, the war strategies are actually the things that's gonna kill us, right? Um, but, and, and I think that that's kind of like the nostalgia of the civil rights movement in a way 
that like I fundamentally believe that they understood themselves to be actively resisting and engaging in war tactics. And at the same time, I think that they, the, I don't think that there's an understanding that this whole thing, any preservation of this whole thing essentially collapses on, on us either way, right? Like any preservation of us is the substantiation of the very empire that we're like trying to go to war with. So I thought that was really brilliant. I know we're um, going over time. So I just wanted to like remind everyone to look at the chat for the one or two minute reminders um, just so that we can give everybody an opportunity to engage. Um, going to John John. Hey everyone. Um... I've never been so excited to hear people ask questions. This is a new feeling. Um, I thought there was another way to do this, but there isn't. So I'm gonna put a poem in the chat and then I'm gonna talk for two minutes and ask my question. Um, it's just the easiest way to get my brain in order. Um, and I'll give you like a minute or two to read it. John, John, it might be worth you reading it into the, the Zoom space for okay. our review. Yeah, okay. A Small Needful Fact by Ross Gay. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which, most likely, some of them, in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Okay, so um, I, um, I'm interested in the remediative function of Black poetry. I'm interested in the psychic and political work that especially, um, particularly uh, African American poets are actively courted and enlisted to perform in exchange for profit publication prestige. Um, we know that poetry is vaunted for certain things, right? Like it resists linearity in a certain way. It, um, you don't need plot in the same way. I'm starting to think about the dark side of poetry. Um, I'm trying to think about how like, yeah, there's this like, this big anti-logic potential that we love poetry for. And what I want to say is that potential is predicated on these inroads that poetry makes into our cultures, into our psyches, um, and how like poetry, Black poetry as an industry facilitates a kind of control, a kind of supplantation, thinking about what um, Professor James said a minute ago, how it prevents focus, how it prohibits focus. Um, so that's where the Captain Maternal has become really useful. Um, and thinking this, because um, I guess I want to say like, you know, poetry is a weapon and we're losing. And I, and I want to say it's because we are failing to bring people back to the war. Um, and so when I was reading um, the quote that's like really hit me over the head was from the introduction to Fulcrum where Professor James says, quote, uh, what do shamed Blacks do when they are the victim and victimizer? Perhaps just simplify the narrative, end quote. Um, and like when I read this poem, okay, I got a lot of poetry friends, I'm a poet, okay? 
people tell me that this poem grieves. They tell me that it's burdened by like an impossibility. Um, they tell me it's observation. It's just speculation. And we know what that means, just speculation. Um, but I want to say like, no, this poem is an argument. Um, and the protocol, like thinking of what Professor James was writing about, like um, the difference between like how resistance is never bureaucratic. Professor James writes, quote, bureaucracies do not grieve. They offer protocol and grief management, end quote. And when I read this poem, I don't see resistance or I don't see what I'm being fed as resistance. I see grief management. I see protocol. And so I'm trying to figure out language to describe what I'm reading um, without like being shamed into not saying that that is what I'm reading. So um, hopefully that helps sort of like contextualize what the fuck I'm talking about. My question um, is, is sort of like what, um, what are the aesthetic and stylistic decisions that Captain Maternals make um, and like to what effect? Um, there's, there's one moment in um, one of the chapters where Professor James is talking about Mamie Till Mobley's um, The Open Casket. And um, she, she says like Mamie Till Mobley despaired. Um, and that struck me as like, that verb has just struck me as like, oh, there was a decision made. And it's not this decision. That, it's not the, the way we've heard it before of, oh, this is resistance, capital R, but this is, this is something else. Um, yeah, so so that's sort of my question, Dr. James. Thank you, John John. Um, yeah, I guess I with that for a moment. I mean, the poem, right? It, I would say it's true that there's a rinsing, right? That you take grief for dirty water and it gets clean through nature and then it it returns to you like in a more pristine form. And I, I wouldn't say that that doesn't happen, but maybe it doesn't mean what people want you to think it means, that there's no closure in that, right? And so with Miss Mobley, you know, Mamie Till Mobley, there's no closure with despair. I mean, you, you can think that, oh, I mean, it was brilliant the way I think about it. I mean, it's it's Mamie Till Mobley and Ida B. Wells. Those are my key ancestors that I think about all the time. But, you know, an open casket funeral mutilated teen. And they had, if I understand correctly, had packed lye in the coffin. So, you know, accelerated decomposition. And then the black funeral director who probably wanted to be more in line with, with the poem was like, let me kind of fix things. And she's no, but he did, you know, like, so, pieces of faces back of face back together so it's not pieces of faces in plural but maybe huh maybe our greatest brilliance is when we encounter the unsolvable and when we know there will be no restitution of what we really want there will be some restitution of something like you know Rosa Parks, I believe, said, I was thinking of Emmett, so I didn't give up my seat. So there's a catalyst. It's a trigger. Like Things will keep rolling down the pike in terms of resistance and human rights and civil rights. But I guess I'm, I'm focusing or stuck on this whole thing of acceptance. Maybe what you actually want is not what you will get. What you actually want is the resurrection of a murdered child. But that's, that's not on the table. You know, so you can bargain, you know, I've written this elsewhere in terms of these compensation packets, 27 million for Brianna, like you can, you know, basketball program name Sunday, like, these are compensation packets, because the state is not a god. It's just a predator. But then we live in between the predator and the god. And I don't I don't think it's about settling, like don't settle for that poem if you think it's really a makeover, right? You just went to the spa and it's just trying to help you with your feelings so you don't freak out. 
but except that someone attempted the intervention, like Amanda Gorman wrote a poem about the, the Rob Elementary School shooting. And I would have preferred not to read it, but I read it. And again, I'm, I'm puzzled about these interventions, but I understand people are doing interventions because they feel they have to do something. But that something is not, it's not the same thing as a confrontation with a predator. And I don't even know what it would take or why anybody would want to do that. I mean, if it's about longevity, that most of the time we're scurrying and hiding and just peeping out when it looks like it's safe. I mean, I, this is what I like about us, you know, if you can call us a people or if somebody says we're not a people, communities, however you want to do it in the plural. There's always surprises. And then we surprise ourselves. I think that our mutation under this level of violence and stress changes everything. It changes the meaning of poetry. It changes the meaning of art. It changes even how we breathe, you know, shallow or deep. And I welcome that. I welcome the mutations. I, I mean, I feel we should get something out of this. So like if mutating is that one thing that they can promise me, like you're not going to, you know, you're going to be a little different and you're going to be wired a little different and you're going to see the world a bit different and you're going to comprehend and still be able to face violence without running out of the room screaming, then that's evolution. Right in. I think you're next. Should I just jump right in? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Professor James. Again, thank you everybody for being here. Um, thank you. It's so hard to follow up, John. <laughs> um, um, so my work is pretty much arguing for the impossibility of, a, of Black erotic sovereignty. Um, so it is my understanding that. Um, Black political thought is in a particular place right now that it understands or it or it attempts to shore up um, some notion of a black sexual self determination, um, which is can be really kind of boiled down to you know the black person's capacity to if not do anything decide its own love objects, and um, I, I find that. I find this kind of black political project to run cover for a state and bourgeois project um, that attempts to um, use love on its behalf, um, attempts to use love as a means to obscure um, and stand in for um, and stand in as a, a set of predatory practices that show up psychosexually, um, but also, which is to say like in every other scale of, of, of our uh, lived existence or unlived existence. Um, and so the Captain Maternal has always been an interesting concept for me because uh, of its reliance on revolutionary love. Or, or like its relationship to love. And so my question is like, is very, you know, I guess probably elementary in the sense that I, I'm just curious why Dr. James, you look to agape. Um, what is, um, how did you come to the concept of revolutionary love um, as predicated on a kind of um, notion of agape and, and how is it that um, we, how is it that we uh, rely on love? Are you, you speaking earlier of concepts that cannot be co-opted? How is it that we put down love as a concept that cannot be co-opted? Um, how do we mobilize that concept as a concept that cannot be co-opted when especially, and you know, 
particular Black feminists and Black queer traditions, what we're seeing is precisely the co-optation of love and the use of love um, to do state projects, right? Um, America looks like a better idea because Black people can love each other within, 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 within this terrible context. So um, yeah, I would just love for you to speak more to the relationship between love uh, and, and, and sovereignty, the relationship between love and the state. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, that's clear or helpful at all. Yeah, it's, it's clear, Jordan and Tub. Um, I remember Agape, you know, decades ago, I would, one, I was in seminary for a while, you know, with Cornell and James Cohen. And then before that, I was, you know, trained in theory, European theory by Jesuits, which is like, that's all warped. So we don't have to talk about it. But there's, there are these different types of love, right? There's familial, there's, you know, amorous, there's like, you know, partner intimacy. I know, I know that. Right, uh, Audrey Lord has said there's a difference between eros and the pornographic, and then you know maybe those differences are not tidy little separate containers. But the thing about agape was was the willing that you had to will yourself to do. It was like not voluntary, and it wasn't reciprocal. I mean, you hope like if you love your partner, your partner loves you back and is not like cheating on you or, you know, taking money out of the bank, but, you know, stuff happens. You hope if you love your kids that, you know, they'll be decent and not go off on you and make demands or like take your credit card. I'm not using real examples. <laughs> Run it up and buy stuff and you find out later. So it's kind of like what I like about Agape is they, it's like they tell you from day one don't expect a lot back. Don't expect, you know, sexual pleasure or the fraternal or the sisterly. Don't expect family bonds. It's political will. If you're going to hang in, you're going to have to will yourself to it. And so in some ways, I know there's been some debate or maybe I don't know how much, you know, I used to think of it as sacrificial because there's a part of me that's just transactional. Like, even when I don't want to be like, yeah, if I spend all this time doing X, Y, and Z for you, I would like to think that when I call, you would pick up the phone, right? But that's not really how it works. So you do the labor and you might as well put the expectations on the shelf or just drop them all together because you will do the labor again the next day because you will will yourself to be present to the need. Whether or not your needs get met, I don't think it's contractual and that anybody agreed that your needs would be met. That your participation in agape is all that you need. And again, you know, I find that problematic as a con contract, right? You know, because I want reciprocity, but it makes sense to me that you would have to will yourself into those kinds of relationships and will yourself to stay, right? And so, yes, from, you know, black love, like the luminaries, Cornell, Hannah, Angela, Kimberly, like they're all like explaining black love. And I don't wanna explain black love because I don't even know what black love is. Black love could be after they bombed the church in Birmingham in 1963 and killed Adam May and the other girls, it could be what some of the working class or so-called lumpen did, like based of what little I know of history, as they start to burn down the city, which nobody talks about. So the victimization is safer for us in the discussion of love than the agency, which takes you to the place of going rogue. And that's why I think agape is scary. Because it's like, wait, you're supposed to stop at the border or, you know, you're only, you know, so far and then you pull back. And like, I'm like, well, what, what are the limits of political will? There are no limits of political will until, you know, they bury you or cremate you. The limits are as far as you take it. It is, it is not using you if you volunteer. And if you volunteer and you can maintain that, then it is 
political animus. Is it a higher form of love? That's what the theologians say. The highest form of love is agape. Why? Because you get nothing from it other than the capacity to love beyond your endurance, which becomes in itself a transformation. So if the point is to continuously mutate, I'd say the fastest way to do it is to go towards agape. And can we like respond like after yeah. everything else? Sure. Like, or do we respond immediately? Like how is the... I, I didn't make the rules, but oh, lovely puppy. About a minute. Okay, great. I'll respond. Right. Okay, so my only concern, I, I, I buy that completely. Like I actually <laughs> absolutely buy that completely in terms of uh, a definition of love without uh, reciprocity. Um, my only fear is that what happens when we place a subject in that position who is endlessly expendable, mm. which by, by, by which I mean like a subject whose very definition, by, de by definition, is constantly um, given and it's, there is no bottom to their ability to give. There is no, there, it, they, they are only expenditure. And so, and, 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 and so we get in this weird position or relationship with expenditure, ceaseless, endless expenditure and violence where all, if all I can do, if all I am is like this constant outpouring, this constant self-sacrifice, then what does, what happens, um, how, does, how does that make this structure in which I'm trying to transform, how does that make my relationship to the structure different from a violent one, right? Okay, thank you for that. It doesn't. You know, the structure dissolves. It, it, your, it is your political will. Nobody's making you do it. You volunteered. You soldier. And why would you do that? I could be wrong. Perhaps there's a level of consciousness, emotional intelligence, rawness, brilliance that you can't see until you step into the zone. Now, the thing is, you shouldn't be shamed if you want to leave. I totally get it. You know, you, you want to check out, like, I'm out. You should go. But mutations are mutations. Like, they're, it's not like spa, right? They're painful. They scar you. They can make you ugly one day radiant another this is Oshun why would you fly to Oludumare to ask for water you I mean you're deity you're not going anywhere and why would you allow yourself to be mutilated by the fire in the rays of the sun it was a choice and what happens the mutation creates another kind of being is it always a success story? No, but I don't think that's what agape was about. I don't even think you can measure success. Like, I'm not sure we can measure freedom. I mean, the best I can think of, you keep the babies alive, you let the elders transition with dignity, and you love and fight simultaneously. Oh, child. Sorry, I just had to let that out. <laughs> um, <laughs> first, I wanted to say that, um, T, I'm really looking forward to your work because being from PG County, I understand that place is somewhere where folks also understand it as a Black maker. So I'm really interested in what you're getting ready to say um, because a lot of how I came to understand my own project was living in PG County, but living in Capitol Heights and using a different address to go to a better school, right? And so understanding the complexities between um, 
Black people and the different types of systems of care that was happening in Capitol Heights versus the access to like state care or just resources that folks were getting in Bowie. Um, and so I, my project is really concerned with the inner workings, I call it, of Black women and girls. And I think that for a long time, I was doing a project about simply love, radical love, care ethics, and the way that Black feminists are teasing them out, describing them, and what they're using them for. Um, and I started deploying June Jordan's resolution 1003 as like my definition of what I wanted love to be and like what how I wanted niggas to take up love because for me that felt like the only thing that could possibly have any subversive power um, and so right now I'm interested in how things like empathy, care, joy, like the rules of all of them, like I, the, the most concrete example I can give is now because of these massacres, we're talking about this thing called collective grief, which I understand to be true. However, we're deploying co collective grief in this way where folks who are not even directly impacted at all are now super over consumed with their collective grief. And now it's an excuse for them to do nothing like once again. And so we've taken this thing that's related to our inner working and we've exploited it and like done work to sustain the state again. Um, and so because I am deeply in the repo justice movement, we have decided that the core tenets to reproductive justice are the right to have a child, the right to not have a child and the right to parent our children in safe and healthy environments. And I would love if you could talk about the captive maternal's relationship to that definition or those tenets of reproductive justice. Um, and I really feel like if these women would just pick up your text, we might get somewhere else in this movement. Um, but right now we've decided that with care, we just need to create alternatives to the state and insular communities. And that's all we need to do. And I think that, no, that doesn't work either. Um, and then I think my last question is, you and I once had a conversation at the conference in Texas, and you had said that um, Black people have trauma and trauma is our superpower, whether we like it or not. And I wanted to know what is the captive maternal's relationship to trauma as, this, as the superpower? How do you understand that for the captive maternal? Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Bria. Good to see you again. I'll maybe start with the last. Um, yeah, the captive maternalized function is engineering in some ways. I mean, how do you function when you're traumatized? But if the very core of their identity is functionality, then where you think of what is traumatic as leading to a form of paralysis or stopping or cessation or pause. I would argue that's not what captive maternal does. And it, that's why I think increasingly of mutation. Like whatever the conventional definition is or the conventional outcomes of what it's supposed to be under the stitching or the weaving or the machinations of the captive maternal it turns into something else. Like, so for those with leisure time, which would be nice, right? If you're depressed or, you know, you get to go to bed and stay in bed. It, it doesn't work if you, you know, have 70 year old who needs insulin and you got a seven year old that you got to feed. I mean, no, you don't go to bed and stay in bed. And so under those conditions, what is your pain? I mean, it's painful, but it is not technically paralysis. Should you have to work while you're in pain? I would say no, but like, you know, we didn't get to write the script. I mean, that's what centuries or how many years of chattel slavery, like you're always in pain and you're always working, right? I think, I'm sorry if I'm, I went to the last one first. What was the first part that you were asking? 
Um, damn, help me out. What was the first part that I asked? Got the transcript. Let me let me go back. Thank you. <laughs> it was reproductive justice. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Thank you. Yeah, there was a panel last month. It was Indiana, I think. Black women who were in healthcare, and I have to find it, but one of them who had had multiple miscarriages and was talking about how bad the medical care was, right? She started talking about the captive maternal. And I didn't even, it's like, well, how does, you know, I'm an academic, how did that, you know, she lost two babies and abhors the medical industry, right? Because for, in some ways it, it can function. I mean, it feels like it's over the top if I say slaughterhouse, but I mean, we know how gynecology evolved, right? So, it, it, they talked about reproductive people. They didn't, they didn't do gender anymore. Like the, I mean, they look, I don't remember their pronouns, but I'm assuming they were black women, right? And some of them work for the local city. And it seemed like they were grappling with everything. It was the right to terminate a pregnancy, but also the right to have a viable pregnancy and the right to like survive giving birth in one of these hospitals when they don't listen to you and they ignore your needs, right? So I was kind of, I was kind of struck, you know, in the recent rulings from the Supreme Court about how, how gnarly this is. And I'm, I'm just going to try to be articulate because for whatever reason, it's pretty difficult for me to, to parse this out. We want the right to reproduce or to not reproduce. But it feels like there's precarity in both zones. Does that make sense? Like if you don't reproduce, I mean, in Texas and other places, you're going to prison for homicide, right? I mean, that's, the, that's where the laws are drifting, right? You terminate a pregnancy, the fetus is human. And this is what one of the, the sisters said on this call. They're like, well, if that's the case and you're pregnant, they can't put you in prison or jail for a crime because if the fetus is human, they haven't gone to the court to say that they were an accessory to the crime. So you have to let the pregnant women out. Does that make sense what I just said? Like you can't, you know, there's so many incarcerated pregnant women and it's like, well, the fetus didn't do the, you know, whatever they're accused of. So you have to let the fetus go. Well, the, if the fetus goes, the mother goes with the fetus. You can't separate the two. So it was the duplicity. It was the hypocrisy, it was the bullshit, right? But this invasiveness into the womb, because this is what I write about in the womb of Western theory, it's the generative power that is the wild card. And I don't wanna do like the black magic super myth thing. Like we can like take anything and make it into, you know, souffle or something like that or a piece of art. But out of necessity, we've taken torture and we've done other things with it to elude it, to elide it, to minimize it or to repurpose it against our assailants. I would, I'm going back to the children. I'm starting to think, at least for me, that whatever we conceptualize has to be from the perspective of the child. Whatever strategy that we put on the table has to be from the perspective of the child. And they're incredibly demanding. Like generally, you know, they don't want to compromise. It's like, I want the whole thing, you know, 100% safety. I don't want like this percentage. I don't want an investment portfolio of harm, right? I think that would transform us. I just don't know, honestly, if we like children that much. Okay, so you're shaking your head now. So Ross says no. And I've talk to folks who've had them and they will say this culture hates children. I mean, we know they hate black people, but I think we don't focus on them. They hate children, which when you feel like, wait, I thought that was your future, right? It, is, it doesn't matter. We hate, I mean, we traffic them, right? 
we exploit them, we gaslight them, we do, you know, we do all kinds of things. The schools suck, they're horrible, even like the ones you pay a fortune for. So if we have the right to reproduce, what does that mean? If we have the right not to reproduce, what does that mean? I think that we would have to claim the definitions of both sectors and to, I don't even know how we make that, whatever marinage looks like, we would have to claim that the womb and the agendered or agendered and whatever gender, no gender, that the womb itself as a reproductive zone cannot be tampered with by the state. question and this is for anyone um I just could could it also be true that we would have to be clear that we don't reproduce children like we we never reproduce children like I I just would want to know that your thoughts on that like it's fine to say that we reproduce something that comes into the world and it becomes black and it functions in the world and it goes through this biological process but it's never a child and that is is the conundrum itself with this whole like looking at it from the demand of the child as if the demand of the child is, <laughs> you know, a child. Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Maybe other people want to jump in too, but I, I rarely say there are sacred categories, but I'm going to extend myself and make this one of them. It's not just about developmental and like you're, neuro landscape isn't fully, you know, expanded or stabilized enough, right? But there's got to be something sacred. And I would say, like, to go back to the issue of spirit and spirituality, and it could sound like cheesy old Hallmark card or something like that, commercial for Mother's Day. I think the child is the closest manifestation of spirit totally unpredictable, not quite socialized into conformity. And without a clear sense of boundaries until you, you know, bribe them or beat them into recognizing boundaries and limits. And that for me, that for me, the fact that we were children, even if we were captive children, even if we were tortured children, even if we were treated as adults, that the zone of vulnerability that resides with this cadre is what makes them totally unique. And it's transitory. It's not a permanent stage. Like, like, was like you know, when did your childhood end? Probably like when you're two or something like that, right? or four, push it to 10 or 12, maybe. But if I had to recognize the manifestation of spirit, I would, I would go with the child. There's nothing else other than like, if you want to talk about the waters or something like that, I mean, I'll go with the natural environment, but there's nothing else that registers as quote human that really interests me. I mean, I respect everybody on this call. And I respect everybody in general, but you know, like if you were four years old, I would be fascinated. Even if you got on my nerves, I probably could only deal with you for five minutes and I'd be like, I gotta go. But you know, there's something that is not quite gelled. It's not even biologically, it's not gel. It's just not quite gelled. And so the possibilities, even though they will be limited are still unknown. Does that make sense? So you could give it another name besides child, but it is still a manifestation of something that remains in the raw. And because it's in the raw, its capacity to mutate is greater than the capacity of 20 year olds or 40 year olds or 60 year olds. Like by the time you get 60, 80s, but it's just about fear. Like, oh, I'm not gonna be mobile. I'm getting dementia. Like, you know, nobody wants to talk to me anymore. Like, it's just so freakingly fear-driven. But when you're too young to comprehend the full meaning of fear, 
outside of you know the beat downs you got when you're too when you when you don't quite know what the the game and the play are that's for me that's fascinating and i would say one thing when i think of our movements from soweto back to Mamie till mobley um it's all about mostly not always but sometimes the movements that just like really we just get out it's you kill children you know you just kill enough children people are like okay well we just we're nothing matters anymore i mean i'd like to come back for dinner but you can't just shoot up the kids and just think life is meaningful i mean that really is the precipice for despair. And then you have to come back from the ledge and figure out what you're going to do, but that will take you to the ledge. Jana? Okay. Um, so I, I just want to preface this by saying that like, Professor James, I'm completely indebted to your work for the questions that have preoccupied me for at least two or three years. Um, and, you know, I'm, uh, as, of, as of yet, I mean, I've only kind of mined the uh, early political uh, writings of Angela Davis, um, some of her earlier, her first lectures, lectures on liberation, um, trying to mine the extent to which she disavows uh, the pressure that anti-Black violence places on the meaning of resistance, refusal, and freedom. Um, and I think more generally, I'm interested in a very simple question. Um, what is Black resistance? And what more precisely is the Blackness of resistance? And if we accept um, that Blackness is always a question of the inner and outer limits of representation of uh, reason, logic, the human, et cetera, then that question could also be posed as it, at what point and under what conditions does the meaning of resistance break down um, and what are the consequences? Another way that it could be framed is actually, was actually articulated by you and Raw in the conversation that you had um, a couple months ago um, and I think you posed the question of what makes Black thought critical? And, you know, I think it's important to read that question not only as about the condition for the possibility of Black critical thought, but also insofar as we accept that critique itself is the ineluctable purview of Western philosophy um, and what you called Western womb theory. Um, we should regard it as a question concerning what, by definition, makes Black critical theory available to the totalizing ontological violence of Western discourse. Um, and another, another quote that came from the conversation that you and Ra had that, that, that really haunts me is uh, from Ra, the university is parasitic on this idea of resistance. And I think following this sort of line of questioning about, uh, you know, whether or not we're able to escape the purview of Western theory in our criticism. Um, I'm interested in what it might mean that we are always already available to and as the predation, dispossession, and parasitism that we seek to name. And I apologize if it gets a little loud, there's like aircraft flying over me. Um, but that, that brings me to uh, the text, right? Like I think, I think the concept of the captive maternal um, not only uh, imbricates those questions, but I think it insists upon them. And so, you know, when you say that captive maternals are those whose very existence enables the possessive empire that claims and dispossesses them, um, and that captive maternals are designated by uh, the function of caretaking, nurturing, and reproduction more so than by their identity. 
the question or sort of series of questions that kind of are all in a way the same question that comes to mind uh, is, you know, if captive maternal caretaking cannot be disarticulated from the maintenance of empire, that is, if as soon as it is performed, it is already doing the work of stabilizing the state and civil society, then is care itself not a problem for thought that in turn poses a problem for the very identification of captive maternity. Put differently, if care is always and only for the master, then how are we to determine what it looks like for us? Does not our idea of care also belong to the master? And if so, would not the care by which we identify captive maternals be in some sense always already mediated by the violence that that identification seeks to name? How moreover, can the, the private realm of family and community, and this is a direct quote, um, that captive maternals are said to nurture have any symbolic integrity if the labor by which this realm is cultivated is also what gives it over to predation and terror? And I think that those are questions that, that um, have been asked in, in different ways already, um, but I think they bear repeating because it gets at precisely the, the conundrum, Professor James, that I think you're trying to draw out. Um, and I just want to bring out one more quote from the text and, and, and some similar questions uh, with regards to that quote. So you say, the Black Matrix is a site of utility and coherence in response to predatory relations, excessive exploitation, and terror in reproductivity. And so I was wondering um, for what and for whom is the Black Matrix a site of utility and coherence? Um, is the Black Matrix outside of the Western womb? Um, are we able, for instance, to discern where the predation and terror of the latter ends and the utility and coherence of the former begins? And if not, from what vantage are we able to make visible the predation of womb theory without granting it its plausible deniability in the form of auto critique? What, in other words, prevents womb theory from accommodating the critique of its own predation and offering up its capacity for self reflexive criticism as an alibi for its ongoing crimes? And you you can enter at whatever point you want to, and I can repeat any of those questions as well. I know that was a, a long series of, of, of questions. Yeah, thank you, Jaden. I mean, I'll try, right? So I saw in the chat, um, yeah, I wasn't trying to say that children are fearless. I was trying to say that children are wild until you break them, right? And so what does the Black Matrix produce? It could be the clone or it could be the rebel. I mean, sometimes we engineer our movements and our relationships as if they will have a specific outcome. Like, oh, I'm gonna make it through this program or I'm gonna, we're gonna end up being married or we're gonna be partners or something like that. It's like, for me, it's the planning stage, right? But sometimes none of it works. Like it collapses, it all fought to, you know, you're like, oh, I thought we were going to be doing this. It's like, no, you just, you know, left or I'm leaving you. Or I thought I was going to take this job. No, I don't want any job at all, right? It's, it's the unpredictability of trying to move through gestation and come out of the womb as something that you would want to claim for yourself. Not that the state wants it, or the corporation wants it, or your parents like the diplomas on their wall in the living room, right? That, that can be seen as feral in some ways. I don't, have a, I don't have a problem with the unstructured because again, I think that agape will create the structure, that the will will reign, you will reign yourself in once you decide that you don't want to be a clone, you will engineer your rebirth. And you don't have to do it by yourself, right? Because there are communities, there are other people who are not sufficiently, quote, tamed. Um, there are people who have desires that exist beyond the capacity 
of the Western society or the Western room to deliver. I don't, I, you know, this is interesting because I wouldn't say that there's not an out, right? But I would say through the stages, the early stages of compromise, there's no out on those levels. But when you move towards Maranage and full-blown rebellion, I mean, you are pretty much leaving the enclosure. What happens to you after you leave the enclosure, as I said before, is they tend to hunt you. Like, even if it's just like, we're gonna, you know, bad mouth you and make sure that you never get another gig or can't, you know, publish anywhere, can't write anywhere. It's like, I mean, so there's different kinds of hunt. It doesn't always have to be like with an AK or whatever. It's just like, we're gonna damage your career or trash your writing, et cetera, et cetera. So the hunt is, the hunt tracks your departure. But the reinvention of yourself is a product of the departure, if that makes sense. I think most of our time is spent on these early stages of compromise because that's what we've been trained to believe will ensure our longevity and also our relevance to our communities. Like I think on a deep level, we wanna be practical or pragmatic. I mean, this is a Black Myths podcast. We were like, well, why can't you be pragmatic? And I said something like, because everybody you respect, I mean, none of them were pragmatic. You know, Malcolm could have taken the money. You know, King could have got a little church. Fannie Lou Hamer could have done X, Y, and Z. It's like, we don't respect anybody who's pragmatic. But when we start talking about our politics, somehow pragmatism like becomes coda. So you don't have ancestors because they're pragmatic and they were bankers. You have ancestors because they loved you enough that they took risks that seemed so irrational. Nobody thought they'd walk away from it. And true, a lot of them didn't walk away from it, but they still exist in memory. And so they exist with you. That is spirit. What could the womb of Western theory produce besides another cage? It could produce an entity that would saw through the bars or tilt the cage over or use the cage to create a breach in the womb itself. Something that would sterilize the womb so that it can never reproduce another slave. I don't know, I haven't seen it all, right? And I'll never see it all. I'll see a fraction of what I can comprehend and then I will just assume that on certain days, certain times, certain decades, I tried to get out. Was I dragged back in? Absolutely. But that doesn't stop me from keep trying to break out. And there are different motivations for escaping the Western womb. I mean, for me on one level, it is just so humiliating. It's because it's so, I mean, it's like, oh my God, really? This is supposed to be like high cold, I mean, it's just, I'm sorry, it's just so humiliating because it's like, well, I mean, what else do you, what, what do you have working for you except for violence? It's, y'all aren't really that smart. You really aren't ethical. You know, you trash the water, the land. I mean, you're killing the frigging planet. I mean, like, why am I even caught in this structure? It's because they run the game. They're the warden. There are all these places where we can go to hide, but at some point we will have to appear with our full or fuller capacity, which means at some point we will have to become targets. The cool thing is you get to decide when and where. You can always go back to those earlier stages. You can always put on a costume or a mask. And then, you know, you could also break out. Does that address any of what you were saying? I think so. Um, I, guess, I guess I'm wondering um, what responsibility we have as 
either organizers or black political theorists and how do we um how how, how is it possible for us to be responsible right. when when we know that you know the, the very discourse the very terms of the discourse upon which we attempt to name this violence um is it, it doesn't belong to us and in fact it it both buttresses and augments the very violence we attempt to name. Um, what does it mean to be responsible, and what, you know, what is there beyond just um, the possibility of um, some kind of breach? Um, because we can, I mean, we know that there's a whole discourse about possibility and, and otherwise worlds and potentiality. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that, yeah. That stuff irritates me. Um, The language is a zone of distortion right now. It's like if you were on the streets and they were doing that mark, like fan, find the Monty, like they keep switching, like the cups and the cards or whatever. It's a shell game. I mean, the banks do that, Deutsche Bank, admirably. I mean, they hide, they hide money, they hide resources, and then they sell you a product that is bullshit, that can take, tank an entire economy, like 2008. That is what our politics are doing now. They're doing a shell game. They have investment portfolios. They have like what's on the books, which is in what really is what's in the holdings. There are derivatives, which you'd have to get access to to figure out what is like, where is the money? Like, no, why? Well, it's like offshore. And weirdly, it's in the Dakotas. So I don't know how they figured that one out. But, you know, from Panama to the Dakota. So it's, it's like capitalism, right? Our politics are embedded in a capitalist empire, racial imp imperialism. We're not going to do, we're not going to do what BLA, Black Liberation Army did, right? We're not going to, I mean, we'll ask for food for the local pantry, but we're not going to hold up drug dealers and shake them down. But literally, We've been shaken down as a people by folks who would never have like a piece. They just have ideas and they have markets and they have brands, right? So how do we even know the language is stable? The language for me is not stable. That's why, I mean, I like kids. Like half the time you don't even know what they're saying, but at least, you know, they didn't master a language of deception, right? And so you just have to intuit or in like, have intuition yourself. Okay, so this is the way I feel about Black people now, maybe because like I hung out too much with the guys who like follow Adolf Reed. This is a hustle. So if you want a rebellion, that's going to be different from a hustle. But make sure you actually want a rebellion because that costs. The hustle is free, right? And so, I mean, they're giving it out like, hey, you want to hustle? Like, you know, take this ideology or follow us and da, da, da. So it, for me, it's not Black anymore because the monetization of Black suffering and the cashing in is done by Black elites. So that's why I went to Revolutionary Love for the collection of essays and stuff. It's just a communal book. It's not even my thoughts. It's me in dialogue with a lot of brilliant people, right? because they care, then I can calm down and try to, you know, ask questions or answer questions. But I only believe in the rebel. I do not believe in the leader. These are predatory zones that promise redemption. It's a hustle. Now, how do you comfort yourself once you realize that you've been hustled by Black people, right? It's, it's, I think it's complicated. I haven't even, I can't quite figure it out because I have my ragey moments and stuff. But I do know one thing, I, even if I inadvertently become one or am sometimes, I do not want to be a hustler. And so if I can just be attentive, like in my own consciousness to check myself when it looks like, I'm starting to hustle or say I have the answers. I mean, that's the, I mean, the joke is like, I keep changing employment zones. That is my attempt to stop me from hustling. 
That's why I say I'm a librarian. That's why I say, you know, because as an academic, I'm trained to hustle. I don't, I'm not sad, I'm just exhausted. And as I said before, I agree to the terms of struggle. And I recognize that I will not survive the struggle, but I accept the terms. I think it becomes difficult when you realize what the terms are and you're like, no, I, mm -mm, I'm not gonna do that. But then what happens is you pretend like you're doing it. I would rather, if you don't want to accept the terms, just say, I'm out of the struggle. And I'd be like, I respect that. You're going to go shop. I mean, it's like, I can't be snarky, do what you're going to do. But it's like, when you claim to be the spiritual leader, when you can't claim to be the healer, when you claim to be the therapeutic interventionist who can like calm everybody down, I'm like, no, I said this decades ago, in order to heal, you need to understand war. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying everybody has to be shot up. You just need to understand. And then if you can comprehend and just not freak out all the time, I think you will find that your connectors will begin to dissipate and you will not, or at least this is happening to me. I'm not looking for black, anything is salvation. I'm looking for revolutionary struggle. And that's gonna be lonelier than being in black community. But as I said before, I accept the terms. Benediction, no, I'm kidding. We have two more. <laughs> we have two more and we have 10 minutes. So um, I love you, Dr. James. Would please look at Anna's time. She oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I'm just trying, to, trying to answer things or respond to No, you're brilliant. And we're all here and soaking it up. But we, you know, I want to be- I'll keep it short. I'll keep it short. Yeah. Okay. So we have Ziana and then Chris is going to follow. And correct me if I'm saying your name wrong because I don't want to mess it up. And then Chris is going to- um follow up and then yeah Dr. James we're going to keep the flow but I just wanted to let you all know we have 10 minutes. Thank you so much. I think um, a lot of my questions have already been answered in the session just before in the answer just before this so um, I'm going to be super quick. Um, I'm so my question essentially is about the stages and I want to know if this is some kind of dialectical progression um, because I get the sense that there's a moment in which Dr. James, you speak about your own family and this sort of incapacity to push through the caregiver, st the caretaker stage. Um, but I was thinking about it. Um, it strikes me as it becomes less and less easy to co-opt the thing that we're doing the further down the line we go, right? So caretaking, very easy to co-opt that labor, um, a protest, super easy uh, but by the stage you at, at the point you get to a maroon um, community it becomes a lot harder right especially if that community has a security apparatus let's say um by the time you as a, by the time you figure yourself as a war resistor it's almost um impossible well maybe not impossible but a lot more difficult and i think and to speak to Ro's question about um, betrayal, I think in the very beginning, these stages, betrayal, the stakes of betrayal are sort of like, they're painful and they're big, but they're not as devastating. And further down the line, they are horrific, right? They can completely destroy any kind of, any kind of project. So, sorry, I'm recovering from COVID, so my voice is, oh. anyway, so I'm just wondering like, how um, do these stages, are they kind of like transcendental? Do they build on each other? Do they, um, and then with that, and a lot of this I'm thinking about because I think about my parents during apartheid. And um, when I was a kid, it was very clear to me that the women who were organizing against apartheid had very particular roles, right? And it was like, I remember as a kid, I walking into a political movement, a meeting that was in the living room, and I was sort of like counting how many people we needed to make coffee for or whatever. My brother had like, there was no, he had no concern. He was like, oh, I don't care. Like, I'm just gonna listen to what they're saying or whatever, right? So I knew that even my mother's position as an organizer was also captive, was also held captive, not by the fact of the actual structure, but also by a tradition of resistance 
that sort of precluded her from being taking on a different form right so she could she was sort of locked in to the first stage of the captive maternal and my dad obviously could whatever and and he gets sort of eventually thought of as a as a absent father because there's a betrayal happening in the country and the entire country is the ANC is going to sell the country away and the whole state will be operating on this level of betrayal which you know the stakes are great so I'm just wondering like are the stages um moments that we get to transcend and and how much space do we give to um kind of forgiving betrayal because I think there is something in using a kind of revolutionary love or agape that that puts us in a position to say okay cool if you're out that's cool and on some level it's not cool right like the betrayal has incredible consequences it um it sits a, we all go back to stage one um after some major betrayal um and we have to go again and it's a it's this and and like you say it's exhausting I, I remember my mother telling us the first instance of betrayal so minor political betrayal she's like I cried for a week and I said never again I don't trust anyone my dad was like yeah man they're gonna be dressed tomorrow again let's keep going and so it's like at what point is this something we forgive at what point is it something we we decide is completely unacceptable and yeah and and how do the stages work are they are we pushing for the fourth one are we stuck in the first is it is it something we can be all at once it, I mean necessarily we'd have to be all four all at, all of the time um but yeah I'm very interested in this um so yeah I think I don't know if I was too long okay I'll try to be really brief you can go through the stages like moving up and moving back I mean it's lateral vertical horizontal I mean there's Again, I use the word mutations a lot. The contradictions are inherent. There's no pristine stage that delivers like the ultimate revolutionary. It's the zone of departure. It's like we tried the compromise. We tried to be the you know vote. We tried to be the politician. We tried to work in you know the NYPD's office, like in the recreation program, et cetera, et cetera. Like once. Once you have a departure and you don't return unless it's out of necessity, like I got to pay my bills, pay my rent, buy some groceries, that becomes as, that becomes inching towards freedom, I would say. And are there contradictions inside? Yes, in terms of heteropatriarchy, in terms of sexism, in terms of homophobia, transphobia, in terms of classism, those are all embedded in our contradictions. But what interests me most is the departure. Does, in terms of the return, yeah, I think there are always going to be returns. But it's the departure, I believe, is when you recognize yourself is not as tethered or chained to the infrastructure. So everyone did agree to. Um stay till 2.10, just so that Deanna and Chris could both get 10 minutes like everyone else, Dr. James, so that's in the chat. Um, so Chris, you have the final question. No pressure, wow, final pressure, question. No, thank you all for you know doing that and, and thank you, Dr. James, for just creating a space. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, so I, I've been, you know, grappling with, you, with, with the material that you created and, kind of going through a, um, I don't know, a, a revelation in the sense of just seeing so much of the things that I want to do, you know, like spelled out, like <laughs> this is, this is the language. Um, yeah. And I, and, and I'm sorry, like, well, I'm, I'm just from third world. So it's like, for me, it's like, I, this is my entry into, you know, having spaces and, and being in, in, in community with academics or people who come from um, academic type of families and structures. So um, my question is um, very simple. I'm currently 
in law school and I'm, I'm starting to figure out that the law school isn't even a place to be revolutionary in, in the sense of my goal, um, this understanding of law is, is, is so predicated on violence and harm um, that the only thing you can do with it is deconstruct it. Um, but so what does that mean as someone who's entering law as a, as a legal scholar um, to teach more people to come through to be those, uh, as, you, as you put it out, um, war resistors? Um, because right now what we're seeing is people being, you know, positioned and praised as like a KBJ or a uh, Thurgood Marshall as these um, civil rights and these, um, you know, anti-Black crusaders, but they are part of the machine. And, <laughs> and it's like, and it doesn't get more apparent and visible that they're part of the machine than, than their roles in these places. However, they're positioned as Black excellence and they're positioned as, you know, tearing something down and it's just like, no, this is only gonna <laughs> get us killed in our faces, like, but they look like us. Um, so I'm kind of wrestling with that is like, what, what does that look like to create legal scholars who truly have the agenda of tearing this shit down? Um, and, and, and for me, it looks like creating a, a, a new law school but that comes with understanding that people are gonna come in and also do harm as well. You know, so like our, our, what we're positioned to now is going to big law, but the big law is behind the big companies that do shit like the Cancer Valley, like, you know, be in opposition to things like the Cancer Valley or, or be in opposition to, um, you know, paying out little, you know, paying out these small amounts of monies for, um, basically killing people. So it, it, in a sense, is what, what is the role of the war resistor in a legal space? That would be my question. And I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. It reminds me of some uh, piece that Samaria Rice and Deshaun um, wrote in Scalawag, right? Which are the limits of legalism when Samaria Rice is trying to open Tamir Rice's uh, case again in order to get justice against you know, the cop who uh, murdered him. So there, did you ever see the spook who sat by the door or read the book? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting film. There was only one copy left because the FBI was just finding them and destroying them. But it's all about like a brother who joins the CIA to get all the training and then takes it out for the rebellion, right? And the person who did, who Sam Greenlee, I believe he wrote the book and he was part of the film with making the film. I mean, he died poor with, uh, you know, cause the FBI just hunted him and he put one copy of the film um, under anonymous name in a vault. And that's the only reason the film exists. Cause they literally, they thought it was a black exploitation. So Hollywood picked it up and then they realized that it was a revolutionary film and then they try to disappear it. So you can find it online, the spooky set by the door. There is, I did something in Mexico with, you know, and they wanted to, sh this white church show Maya Angelou. We wear the mask and she was tearing up at the end. And I kind of didn't appreciate that because it wasn't my idea, but I had to roll with it, right? And I understood her grief and pain but I also understood that like, you know, other pe people sh shred the mask. I mean, you just have to deal with the consequences of ripping it off. But that also means you could put it back on if you are infiltrating something. If it, again, it's Charlene Mitchell, go into this library and take something out and do something with it and distribute it to the communities, right? And those deliverables, I mean, everybody, in this setting has the capacity to deliver at a very high and sophisticated rate. It may not feel comforting while you're doing it and it may not feel like it's sufficient to the need, but you're not hustling and you're not selling. 
and you're not mystifying language. So your integrity in itself becomes liberatory. I mean, what's the possibility like that there are many rebels, many captive maternals on the rebel stage, but we just pass by each other and we nod. Like we, we don't really hook up because we're hooked up with different folks, different zones. We have jobs, we have schools, we have whatever, but we can recognize each other on the street or in the protest or in international advocacy to stop the wars, AFRICOM. I mean, we recognize each other. We don't have to know to the T what we each are doing. We just have to trust that we're doing something. And, and for me, that's, that's sufficient. Like, I think it's brilliant if you, you know, Center for Constitutional Rights, the Black Law Clinic, there's a number of people who've been trying to make law work for um, folks and not for corporations or state, and they'll continue doing it. So I think, you know, not, not trying to take up all this space, but I think you have to judge your capacity and desire. And how much duplicity are you willing or just to be a shadow self that people can't read you fully until you accomplish what you want. And then by it's too late. I mean, they can't stop you because you already, you know, you already did the deed. You already created the moment. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Um, but you, st you start to see um, this, this, you know, co-opting, like, like, for example, there are um, now, you know, um, I'm on the board of like national uh, you know, disability rights for law students, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, so we see that as, as providing access to, um, you know, law students with disabilities or com accommodations and things like that. But, you know, there's a small part of me that is pushing back because I know that some of these people that we provide access to will go in and go into big law and do these things that will lead to more people being disabled and mm -hmm. <laughs> harmed. And so it's, it's getting a certain class through to only create new victims in, in a sense. Um, yeah, I can't, I remember what George Jackson wrote in Soledad Brother that um, the definition of fascism is law. And again, I've said before, like, I didn't quite agree when I first read it. And then I was like, wait, wait, wait a minute, maybe. But yeah, this is the thing. We have one foot in and one foot out. And we could have both feet out, but that's not what we want. I mean, that's not what we're doing in this moment. I don't know what we want, right? What you individually want. I'm not even sure half the time what I want. But we have the capacity to keep one foot in and move one foot out. And I think that we should develop that capacity and understand when it's time to leave, you'll, you'll leave or time to move on or breach the womb or make the womb something that cannot reproduce another slave. I mean, when it's, when it's time, I think you will recognize that. I don't think anybody else I don't think anybody else could tell you. And I don't think you'd believe them if they did tell you. Exactly. Thank you for that. Right. Excellent. This was really great. Yeah. Oh, Jordan, really briefly, did you wanna say something really quick? Yeah, I just wanted to ask like, I agree. I'm just wondering how does, how do we, how do we like, hold that and also like maintain the necessity of critiquing people like Charlene, Charlene Carruthers and Alicia Garza and you know like the industry of this right so like we have to um, um you have taught me more than anyone else that like we should name names and be very specific about like the people who are who are not only like operatives but are actually like co-operatives um and and um thinking of themselves as one foot in one foot out but in fact like using that straddling as um a hustle in and of itself 
And so like, I'm, I'm wondering, like, how do you maintain this critique while also understanding oneself to be like negotiating terms? Okay, let me see if I understand. I mean, I think the hustlers come to you when they think that you've invaded their territory or turf. And then it becomes like, you know, this is my corner. Like, who, you know, who told you you could be here kind of thing, right? I think you need to have defense strategies for when that happens, but not get overly emotionally or how to say it. Sometimes the emotional register of betrayal can just be paralyzing because you're like, what the heck? I wrote you checks or I adored you or I went to your talk, I bought your book. You know, it could go on and on and on. So I think it's part of it is the ability to let go of the betrayal and those who betray you, but to be really clear that you recognize their pattern. So the next time they step to you, you can anticipate and you can deflect or you can do a preemptive, right? So I don't, I mean, I feel like I did it once or twice, actually maybe three or four times, but I'm not really, I don't want to keep, you know, the icons and the, I mean, it's just, I, I just would rather be left alone and, you know, I'm sure they would like me to leave them alone. I think the heart of the matter is the fear of our communities that think that they cannot survive without celebrity leadership. The dependency on celebrities, on powerful, famous, rich black people, that is our Achilles heel. That is when we will limp through everything. And so I'm just, I guess that's what in pursuit of revolutionary love is this small little press in Britain or Brussels, right? It's just like collectively, this is how we think. So try not to be an individual target or, you know, and understand the betrayal comes with the play. There's no move for liberation that is never betrayed. It is always betrayed. And so once we emotionally can adjust to that, then I think we can like be very perceptive to anticipate what direction it's coming from and what their plan be and to deflect or neuter it to the best of our capacity. But mostly we have to focus on our own work because if not, part of the play becomes to use up your energy, your emotional register, you know, to complain and you have the right to, but to say we've been betrayed or they played me or they took my ideas or they took the concept or they, you know, they played the movement. That just puts you on their leash. I mean, so I think whether it's legal, intellectual, artistic, poetic, I think whatever going rogue or having some autonomy or going into maronage, I think those are the surprise moments where they cannot track you. And it's not clear to them what you are doing. And sometimes they should not know what you're doing until you're ready for everybody to know. And then of course, once they know, then yeah, if it's got quality and it will be you who you are, they're gonna take a piece of it and we've, you know, reupholster it and put their brand on it. But if you get caught, or just say for myself, if I get emotionally caught into like, you know, betrayals over 20, 30 years or something like that, then it, it becomes obsessive for me. It's like the parents, you know, who screwed you over, didn't parent, didn't do their job didn't support you, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes really profoundly deep. So, you know, I, like I, my joke is I cross the street, but, you know, sometimes they'll follow you. So you need to have a plan, right? And again, I think that comes to community who, whatever your collective community is, I mean, they'll, they'll hold you. And that's why you, that's, I didn't even think of this till now. That's why you can practice agape because I thought it was desolation, but it's not, you're actually being held.
I'm laughing because that's, that's Jordan's project <laughs> to be held in the hold. So I'm like, well, not the title, the totality of your project, but it's like straight there. Thank you, Dr. James. It's always an honor to be in conversation with you. Um, thank you everyone for committing over the time limit. I'm gonna let Anna close us out, but I put in the chat to just be like, you know, look on the lookout for the writing form information. And if anyone wants to give final remarks, Dr. James, you wanna give final remarks? And then um, Anna, you can close us out. Awesome, thanks y'all. Um, I'm like, I don't even know what to say right now. Um, but maybe what I'll say is um, I'll, I'll bring in a, a friend who is not able to join us today, but who's been a major uh, thought partner in thinking with the captive maternal as, as a way to make sense of practitioners work on the ground. I work with like educators, um, social workers, therapists, people who are facilitating healing spaces, um, trying to create these, these spaces of care. And um, Dalen Pacheco-Smith, you might know him as a fugitive healer, he talks about this idea of relief. And I feel like that's what Captive Eternal offers me. Um, it offers me some relief in being able to confront violence um, in the space of captivity and with the aspiration of, of care. Um, and so I'm, I'm sitting with that in my, in my work thinking about um, the projects of, of Black educators, our legacies of uplift, um, our legacies of co-conspiring with the state, um, and what, what Captain Maternal might offer us in some alternative strategies, some alternative visions, um, and, and alternative muses. And so with that, um, be well. Um, know that you'll hear from us over these next few months in terms of follow-up um, access to this recording engagement on the um, writing projects as well um, and then maybe some collective spaces for us to just keep the conversation going um, i i love a, a zoom writing group and so if people need support in in doing that work we can we can cook up some things um, but with that, I'll stay on the Zoom in case folks have questions, comments, concerns, wonderings. Um, and then Rod, Dr. James, is, if there's anything else, feel free to share. Dr. James, did you wanna say anything, any final remarks before you close out? Yeah, I think you said something about a benediction, Rod. So I think that's like a blessing, right? Sort of, not really. Okay, whatever. It's a farewell. It's a farewell, <laughs> yeah. So I just, appreciate your blessings that in your gifts that you shared with me and I wish you all well. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Yaron. Thank you. Thank y'all so much. Thank, Thank y'all. So good to see you, Melvina. So good to see you too. I got so many questions around the Captain Fraternal War, but I'm gonna just hold on. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I noticed like we couldn't get everything out, but um, I'm just grateful that y'all were able to show up and of course. offer, especially Brie, you always give that Black feminist critique. I'm like, I'm bringing you with me everywhere. <laughs> everywhere that I can critique Black feminism, I'm bringing Brie <laughs> Oh, I'll be trying. <laughs> Thank you, though, for the invite. I really appreciate it. Um, and Brie, I, I would love to talk more of these. So I'm, I'm going to slide into your inbox. Please, let's do anything to help me get through this project. Raw knows I'm struggling <laughs> with my commitment to love. So I got, I'm, I'm, it's a struggle, but. So is Dr. James, as we all saw today. Yes. <laughs> Right, John House Mexico. Everybody. Bye. So, you know, chilling, screaming at my dog <laughs> like always. How are y'all? We're good. This is like so long and full. Oh, are we still recording? Oh, mm -hmm. shit.